Good morning and welcome to worship on this first Sunday of Lent with the people of Phillips United Methodist Church in Lakewood, Colorado. I'm Joyce de Tony Hill and with me leading worship is Sue Alleman and Marilyn McGraw, Kevin Conroy, Darcy Wood and our behind the scenes communication team. The psalmist pleads in Psalm 25, Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me because you are my God and my Savior. My hope is in you all the day long. As we journey through Lent, may we put our trust in our divine teacher who shows us all of those holy pathways and calls us to be our best selves. And now Darcy Wood will, is, will lead us in our call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Now is the time for us to worship. Now is the time for us to come. So come, you who in God's sight are perfectly imperfect. Come, you who want more of God. Come, you who heard God remind you that you are special and loved beyond measure. Come, people of God, those unified in the waters of baptism, come. everybody. I hope you're all doing well. This morning I'd like to spend a few minutes chatting with you about what it means to be prepared and in a couple of different ways. We certainly saw the importance of being prepared last week, didn't we, with that crazy, wild, wicked cold weather that we had. I hope you guys were all prepared with nice warm hats and gloves and mittens and scarves and coats and boots. And then after being outside, you were able to come inside and have a nice cup of hot chocolate. Sometimes we can get caught off guard being prepared for things like crazy weather. And it's certainly, to be, it's certainly important to be prepared for something like this. And that's what Lent's all about, being prepared, but in a different way. Preparing ourselves to do what God wants us to do, just like Jesus prepared himself for what God wanted him to do. Jesus knew that what God wanted him to do was going to be very, very difficult. But he also knew that he would soon be raised from the dead and be able to return to heaven to be with his father. And Jesus spent a lot of time preparing everybody around him for the time after he was gone. 
He spent with time with the people in the villages around where he was, teaching them about God and the Holy Spirit, so they would know after he was gone that the Holy Spirit would always be with them to help them and to guide them. He also spent time with his special friends, his disciples, teaching them the same things about God and the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit would be with them, but also teaching them everything that they would know to be able to go out into all the countries around Israel where they were and be able to teach those people about God and the Holy Spirit. And finally, he spent a lot of time alone. He would go out into the desert for long periods of time thinking about what lay ahead for him and praying to God for the strength for him to be able to get through it. Now Lent's also a time for us to not only remember Jesus' death and resurrection, but to also remember and celebrate everything that he taught us about loving and serving God. And one way to remember his sacrifice for us is for us to sacrifice a little bit and give up something that's important. Now, this could be something like spending less time playing video games or on the computer or on our phones, or maybe less time watching TV, but maybe hardest of all, maybe giving up some special things that we like to eat, like pizza or candy. I know those things would be really hard for me to, to give up, that's for sure. But that is a way for us to remember his sacrifice, and it's an important thing and the right thing to do. Now, during Lent, we think about what Jesus endured, but also about how he lived his life according to God's plan. And we need to remember that God has a plan for us. We know that at times he wasn't so sure about God's plan. And that's why he spent so much time preparing himself. And at times we might not be so sure about God's plan. So during Lent, we need to think hard about what God wants us to do and to prepare ourselves to do that, whatever it might be. We should take extra time to pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us. We should read our Bibles. We should go to church and we should talk to our parents or other people for advice. Let's say a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to live a perfect life. Thank you that he can help us when we are tempted. Help us to prepare our hearts and our minds so that we can serve you to do your will. Thank you for your love. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, everyone. So good to be with you this first Sunday of Lent. It's a time when we gather together and remember our commitment to God and examine our own self and find ourselves wondering who we are and who we are in relationship to the God who loves us and creates us. We are grateful for the opportunity to live in this state, Colorado. And as I think about our nation at this point, we're feeling extra grateful for where we live. I especially want to hold in prayer those people that live in Texas who've been without power and without water. What a, a, We take those things for granted, but to think of going without those two essentials in our life. And in our own church community, we have several different uh, persons who need our special prayers at this time. So I want to mention those people to you so that you'll hold them in your hearts with prayer. First of all, pre please pray for Joni and Marion Ray. Both have been diagnosed with cancer. Joni's has spread to her lungs, liver, and pancreas. Marion has an appointment on February 23rd to learn more about the severity of his cancer. Then please pray for the family of Esther Starr. Esther passed away last Sunday. And of course, I already mentioned to you, but please continue to pray for the family of Clayton Nadier. He passed away on the fifth of the month. And hold in your prayers, Barbara Stutzman. She's having cataract surgery on both eyes in the upcoming weeks. I also learned 
that Shelly Bowles had to have some throat surgery. So we want to hold her in prayer. She's had so many different surgeries this year, and here another one. So thanks that you can uh, mention her and pray for her some more. And also, please continue to pray for Nell Crafton. Her back severity continues. And so hopefully she can find some relief. And now we'll have a time of silent prayer when you will want to pray for, pray for these and also perhaps some others of your neighbors and friends that are especially meaningful to you. So let's have a quiet time to pray and then we'll pray together. Let us pray. Oh God, you are the one that created us, that gave us special gifts of life and love, of family and fellowship and friends. You have given us those things which make our lives meaningful. Help us remember how we are very blessed because of those gifts. Be with us and bless us during this Lenten season. Help us remember during this season to look at ourselves and find out our own relationship with you and help us remember who we are as your servants. You are the one who has given us so many things and we worship you for that. And we worship you for our ears that listen for you to speak to us, your saving truth into our lives. We worship you in the silent spaces where we struggle for hope and courage. We long for a glimpse of your glory, the glory that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. The glory that touches lives with beauty so holy that it heals the wounded soul. We thank you, God, you give us strength for wearying times. And we thank you that you are with those who are struggling, those who have loneliness and despair, those who are struggling with illness and pain, be with them and bless them and help them and give them your healing touch, O oh God. Especially we thank you during this season of Lent for that one, your son, who gave his very life for us. And we pray together in his name, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, I am Maddie Wood. I'm in the youth groups at Phillips UNC. Today I wanted to talk to you about a special project that the youth of Phillips are sponsoring during this season of Lent. Usually during the season of Lent, Mr. Churchy gets us all really excited about the Heifer Project. The Heifer Project has been a huge success at Phillips my entire life. We have raised funds to buy bees, trees, fish, camels, goats, cows, llamas and alpacas, and I'm pretty sure many other animals. A big part of the fun of raising money for the Heifer Project is the friendly competitions that we have in trying to raise money, and of course, launching our animals from the Phillips Sanctuary across the world with amazing contraptions always built by Mr. Churchy and his team. This year, since we cannot be together to raise the funds, we want to invite you to make an impact here in our local community where we can see our impacts at work. This year, the youth are participating in the Mountain Sky Conference of the United Methodist Church Food Drive. We are trying to collect as much non-perishable food items and monetary donations as we can. All food donations are mon and monetary donations will be given to the Action Center in Jetco. The Action Center makes a huge difference in our community. Here's your job. 
Collect food from your house, your neighbors, friends, or family members. Tell them they can make a monetary donation if they would like. Ch checks can be made payable to the Action Center or Phillips UMC with Action Center written in the memo line. You can bring your donations to church anytime prior or to April 4th, which is Easter Sunday, and the youth group will get them to the Action Center. Raising money for Heifer Project has always been a great success. Let's see what we can do this year to make a difference in our local community. Please join me in the offering prayer. Holy God, as we start the journey of Lent, give us a will of repentance, a mind of sacrificial love, and a heart of gratitude. Indeed, you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We offer our gifts and our whole selves, asking that you might strengthen us for the journey. In the name of the Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. scripture passages to share with you. The first is from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opened and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, thou art my beloved son, with thee I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of, his God, of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Thus ends the reading of the word. May God bless this reading.
As we prepare to hear the word proclaimed, I invite you to pray with me. Lead us in your truth, O Lord. Teach us your ways and your paths. Instruct us through your word as we receive your lessons. Amen. Well, I'm a kind of person that whenever I hear something interesting, I, I tend to go straight to, to uh, Google and look it up, whether it's a song or a place or whatever it is. And um, I've learned about a place in Indiana that caught my eye. And uh, that becomes a, a story for our message. And first of all, I want to begin by extending my appreciation to Reverend Ryan Algrim for his terrific thoughts on this passage. And, and it was his thoughts that directed me to this um, old town on the Wabash River in Indiana. The settlement was called New Harmony. It was founded in 1825 by Robert Owens, who wanted to create the perfect society. He wanted this town to be a place of innovation and creativity and prosperity. And how he was going to do this was to use the cutting edge techniques of education and science and technology, communal, equal living. Everybody had a part to play in this community. And he put it out in all the newspapers. If you feel called to do this, anyone and everyone is welcome to come to New Harmony. So all kinds of gifted people and some not so gifted people responded to this invitation to create a new kind of society. They did remarkable things in New Harmony. They created a free public education system. They were the first in the United States to offer a free public library. They had a town community drama group. They did a lot of amazing thing and so many of the people went on to become major leaders in the state of Indiana and also in the United States. Well despite everything, things just started to unravel in just two years and in four years New Harmony disbanded completely. So we might ask what in the world went wrong here? Here's what went wrong. There were people involved. That's what it was. <laughs> there were selfish people and arrogant people and lazy people and grouchy people and people who came to New Harmony thinking that they could escape some of their moral values. In other words, they were human being kinds of people. And if you look at our history, we have a country of dreamers who try to create all these wonderful utopian communities. And as I look back on my own uh, ancestry, even my ancestors came to the United States from England with the famous Winthrop fleet in the 1600s. And their purpose for coming to the US was to create the shining city on a hill. In my research, I looked to see if they did it, and I don't see anything shining from those efforts. As we see with Winthrop and with New Harmony, every time they try, they fail at it. And it's for the same reason. We're just made of people. We are flawed, and we are imperfect. And this is the core message of the famous story in Genesis of the flood. At the heart of the story is the truth that we are all flawed by human nature. So we often focus on this story by telling stories about arcs and rainbows and animals, but there is a much greater part to the story. So in the story, God creates humanity and quickly realizes everything is going downhill. 
Human beings start to compete with each other. They harm each other. They exploit each other. They are wealthy, and those who have the wealth pass it on to their families, and it stays in their families. And some people are desperately poor, and they pass their poverty on to their families, and there it stays. And then these human beings start fighting over the resources. They fight over water and oil and diamonds and gold, and then they get weapons to protect things. Weapons over time become more lethal. They start with spears and clubs, and it evolves into guns and bombs and poison gas and nuclear weapons, and each one of those things are capable of killing millions and contaminating the earth for generations. Well, they exploit the land. They pump the toxins into the atmosphere and the earth. And the people of the world become fearful and resentful of all the stuff going on, and they start acting out against one another in violent ways. And then we have things like politicians acting out in ways that polarize the people from each other instead of uniting the people. So God looks at everything in the world and sees the humans and recognizes that the humans have stained everything that God created and called so good. And God is sorry for making those humans. What a mistake, God thinks, except that there is one who does please God. His name is Noah. And God says to Noah, I have decided on doing a big do-over. I'm going to start fresh, and I'm going to blot out everything that the human beings have corrupted. I'm even going as far as blotting out the animal kingdom. And this time, I'm going to choose you and your family to be the startup for the new creation. So I want you to build a boat with these dimensions, and it's going to be a big one because I want it to be able to hold your family and two of every kind of animal for the big startup. So stock it with supplies because a giant flood is coming. So Noah faithfully builds this ark. And does he wonder Am I as good as God thinks I am? Am I truly capable of creating the ideal humanity? No pressure there. Well, the time comes for the great flood, and the ice sheets in the north and the south of the earth start to melt, and the atmosphere is filled with condensation and filling the heavy clouds, and now the heavy clouds fill, and they begin to pour out, and the rivers fill up, and the dams break, and there's great hurricanes, and everything is swept away. It cleanses the huge stain. There's precipitation for 40 days and 40 nights. And after 40 days, the water rises up still for a good long time. And then with the ark just bobbing along on all those waves, God remembers. And the waters recede. It lands on top of a giant mountain. And God sends out a dove from the window or Noah sends the dove from the window to fly out along with the ravens to find out if there might be dry land in the vicinity. The dove returns, no place to land. So Noah waits a little longer. The dove returns with a leaf. That's good news. And Noah waits again for a while and sends the dove out. And this time... The dove does not return. So you can just imagine the light beaming in as Noah opens the door and all the animals come bounding out from their cabin fever, along with Noah's family right behind them. And Noah, a, fa a faithful man, sacrifices with great gratitude and thanksgiving. 
God sees that gratitude. And then God looks a little closer and sees something else. God recognizes that Noah is not a perfect person, nor is his family. Noah and family still have the same flaws. Deep within them is still the inclination towards selfishness and fear and harmfulness. So, God shifts a bit and makes a decision. And this decision is a very important turning point of the story. So God says to Noah, Noah, I am going to make you a promise, an agreement. There are no strings attached. It is unconditional. Never again will I blot out humanity and creation. Never again. I am making a covenant with you, creation, your family, and your family's descendants. Never again will I be an adversary. I am always going to be on your side. Even though you are having the capacity to be evil and flawed, I will be on your side always. And then God seals the covenant with a sign. And that's the part we all know and love so well in the story. God puts the rainbow in the sky. But let's remember, it is a bow. It's a weapon. And it is an unstrung bow, an unarmed weapon. And that makes it a symbol of peace. Then the full range of colors is a sign of God's abundance and generosity that pours out onto everyone. And God declares that whenever I, God, sees the bow, I will remember this covenant. Well, this grand and very favorite story is in the early part of the of of the Bible in the book of Genesis. And it's there because it sets the theme for God's people. And we see that this is also a pattern throughout God's relationship with God's covenant people. God is always creating these covenants. God, we see, sets off on a mission to rescue us from our own self-destruction. This is a step in how God rescues us from ourselves. If we try to fix humanity by taking the very best of us and try to even start over again, it's just not going to work in our human condition. You cannot pick the right gender, the right class or race or political or theological ideas in order to make perfection. It's not going to happen. You can even try to fix humanity with genetic engineering. That's not going to fix us all up either. But there is hope. And the hope is not in us, in our visions for perfection. The hope is in God's grace. The first step is for us to embrace the covenant that God is on our side. Now, this is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. And for the next 40 days, we are going to be journeying to the cross in Jerusalem. We are going to be looking at these stepping stones of God's promises and embracing those promises as we head into the season uh, of Easter, really. And the story is, the stories are going to be different kinds of stories, most likely not stories we know that are going to lift up God's grace and compassion. We find that God's relationship, the stories of God's relationship with people, is a long and complicated story, and it is a long journey. The first step on our journey is to embrace the grace of God. I want to go back to another favorite image. 
We can't talk about this grand story without at least mentioning the ark. And I want you to just imagine the ark bobbing along in the midst of the snow and the rain and whatever precipitation is coming about. It's bobbing about. There may be even be some high waves along the way. Did you know that since the beginning of time of the church, that the ark, the boat, is an, has been an image for the church? And that is why, if you look at different ways, uh, architecture of churches, you will see that many of the designs for churches are like a boat. And we even have the words of the boat in there, like nave. In a sense, the church is Noah's Ark in the midst of the storm. Life on, uh, on the Ark, we also know, is not utopian. It's not so simple. It can even be a bit stinky. Why? Because it's made of people, imperfect people. Grouchy, selfish, arrogant, apathetic, kinds of people at times. But I know that if we can embrace the grace of God and that covenant, and we share that grace with one another, our life on the ark is so much better than the storm outside. Well, let's look at that rainbow. May we embrace its grace as the first step on that journey of salvation. Ezekiel the prophet reminded a very troubled people of God's abundance when he said, God says to you, I'm going to take from you your heart of stone. And I'm going to replace that stony, hard heart of yours and replace it with a heart of flesh, meaning a tender, compassionate, feeling, compliant spirit. That's what it means. I invite those of you who have your stones with you to... Um, Turn to the part of the stone that says heart of stone and uh, hold that in your hand. You can put your hand over it or, or just look at it or put it in a place where others in your family can see it. Hold on to that stone as I offer this prayer of confession. Let us pray. Oh God, we long to, that you know us at our very best and we long to hear the words that you are my beloved child. With you, I am so well pleased. And yet we remember the times when our words and actions have hurt your heart and the hearts of others. And for these acts, forgive us, we pray. We remember when we have caused harm by failing to act or failing to speak up. And for these actions, forgive us. And now, I invite you to take that stone, turn it over, and view the heart of flesh, the vision of what God has for us. And embrace the covenant of God's grace as we hear these words of assurance. Our God renews and restores us in loving kindness, or hesed. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
People of God, receive the benediction. Walk in the path of steadfast love and faithfulness. Dwell in the rainbow of God's love as God's children with whom God is well pleased. Go in peace, love, and joy of your faith. Amen. <laughs>